What's up, our church? Thank you for joining our online. My name is Chris, and you are going to love today's message. Something that really inspired me today from today's message was, it came from Dean, and he said, we can come together in sameness to be in community, but our uniqueness is what expands and elevates our community. Hopefully you find something in this video that inspires you, and you can drop a comment right below. Enjoy, here's Dean. We're walking through the Lord's Prayer and, and talking about what it means to us, and we're trying to learn it. Jesus, when the disciples wanted to know how to pray, he didn't tell them to pray for somebody to create penicillin, although that would have been nice. He didn't pray that somebody teach, uh, that somebody get a revelation about how to do Wi-Fi. He, he taught them to pray this way, and I'm trying to get all the kids in Sunday school to learn it. We're going to give them a little pancake breakfast if they learned it. If you're here in your 70s and you still haven't learned it, I'll give you a pancake too. It's good to have the Lord's Prayer in every pocket you've got. You can pull it out in the ambulance. You can pull it out at your desk. You can say it under your breath. You can recite it in the car. Let's say it together this morning. Can we all stand while we're saying it? Jesus, it says, taught them to pray these words. Don't put it up on the screen. We're going to try our memories, all right? Get the old memories going. He taught them to pray this way. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good job. We got some memorizers here. Today, by the way, welcome to everyone who's watching online from the beach. Come on from the RV. I'm glad you're enjoying, are you enjoying your summer? I don't want to be a killjoy, but you better enjoy it now, because rain is coming. Um, this is the portion I want to focus on today. This is how it says it in the uh, King James. Give us this day our daily bread, daily sustenance. You don't get any more plain than bread. This is not praying for more than enough. It's saying, God, sustain us. And I believe daily bread can be encompassed in asking God. When I go through daily bread, I pray, Lord, for the offerings that come to the church, for deals to come my way, for people, you know, to repay their debts. You know, I mean, I just kind of, I, I go into all the things I need to sustain myself, which means rent, which means gas for the car. It's not too much Jesus told you, pray for your daily bread. Even if you're working for it, you should pray for it. Right? That God give you the right job. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. We ask him for forgiveness. Now watch how this works. But forgiveness just doesn't come to you like a little pond. It comes through you like a river. Forgiveness is a river. Do not be a dead end for forgiveness. You, you've received it, you give it away. It says, forgive us our debtors and, le and let us forgive the people that hurt us. Forgive us our trespasses and we're going to keep the forgiveness going by forgiving those that have hurt us. Now it says, lead us not into temptation. This is about confessing with our mouth that God is not trying to trick you into a dead end. He's not, just kind of like, well, God must want me to be broke. Now, God's not trying to get you into trouble. He's trying to get you out of something, right? He's trying to get you out of trouble. He's not trying to dead end you. He's trying to get you in a new, new place, a higher level, not a lower level. So we confess, you're not going to lead us into temptation, but every step you're going to deliver us. From evil, for yours is the kingdom, which means this is not a democracy. You and God can't. I had one guy say to me one time, 
when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, and me and Jesus, we're going to have a real talk. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, this is not Boeing. Uh, you don't have a union rep in heaven. <laughs> You're not going to negotiate your way out of it. This is a kingdom. He is the king, which means he makes the rules. And it says it's also the power. You say, well, King Charles doesn't have any power because it's a form of king stripped of its impact. This is not that. This is the kingdom and the power. He, he makes the rules, and then he can give you the authority to execute every promise he gives you. This is why we, the, Jesus said to his disciples, I give all authority on heaven and earth has been given me, and I give it to you. Go pray for the sick. Are you guys Christians? I can't tell. It's just a, it's a, it's a quiet vibe today. You have all authority on earth because Jesus gave it to you. So the kingdom, the power, and the glory, which means at the end of it, God is going to get all the credit for what happened through you. Now, people aren't going to go, isn't Melanie wonderful? Melanie is wonderful. But it's Jesus in Melanie that you really love, right? So that's, that's the idea. Here's how they said it in the message paraphrase. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. And keep us safe from ourselves and from the devil. Isn't that good? Because sometimes I need saving from Dean. Because Dean, Dean <laughs> creates, uh, Dean is his own worst enemy. And maybe you have the same, uh, same sensation. We got to keep, keep me protected from me and from the devil. So this morning I want to talk about how, how interesting it is that this is a broad, so broad that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we, we're praying as if we were all the same. Say, we are all the same. One more time, say, we are all the same. Yeah, this is a great truth. We're all the same. Yet, the prayer also makes room for the fact that you're a little different than I am. Because although we're all the same, we're all unique. Say that with me. We are all unique. One more time. We are all unique. You say, that's weird. Those are opposites. We have a word for that. We call it... A a paradox, when two things that seem to be opposite are true at the same time. And I think in 2023, maybe we've lost the appreciation for paradox because people tend to live with one truth or the other. May I illustrate? This is where you say, yes, Dean, please illustrate. Thank you so much. On this end, we have people with this affirmation that say, we are unique. One more time, say that. Okay, if that's the only truth that you live your life by, you, you are going to walk yourself into trouble with God and humans. Because it is true that you are unique. But there are people, and in my circle... Generally, my secular friends, these are generalizations, but they tend to make that mistake more than my religious friends. And I am unique, and that is my whole philosophy, gets you into trouble in the following ways. You basically, in the extreme, and I'm, I'm talking in extremes, in the extreme, I am unique leads you to things to, like where you're a god unto yourself. Hey, you can't tell me what sin is because I decide what sin is. You can't tell me right from wrong. You can't tell me what sexual behavior is right. You can't tell me what stealing. I decide if, if my heart was right when I stole that stuff. If I was hungry enough, i call stealing okay. But based on how I process the world, right? And I decide what gender I am, and I decide what what sex I am, and I decide 
how, how marriages should run. And I decide morality. I decide the good people or the bad people. In the extreme, that's a form of declaring yourself God. And there are people that live their life that way. On the other extreme are the people who don't acknowledge uniqueness at all. And generally speaking, it's a generalization, <laughs> generally speaking, for me, my religious friends t t tend to make this mistake. Where my secular friends over there tend to make the other one. In the extreme, this we are the same. Everybody say we are the same. If that's the only truth you live, what happens is you tend to be very lacking in grace. Because you say, none of us should have tattoos. None of us should go to church without a tie. None of us should like that kind of music. None of us should wear makeup. Anybody grow up in a religious circle like that? None of us should go bowling. None of us should dance. No, you know, nobody? Nobody grew up in an environment like that? Did you hear about the Baptist guy who wouldn't uh, have premarital sex because he was afraid it was going to lead to dancing? Did nobody? <laughs> nobody? <laughs> it's an old joke, but it's great. <laughs> You'll get it later. But um, those are extremes. Say extremes. Yeah. The reality is both of those are true. And if you can live both of those at the same time, you're going to find yourself capable of being in the center of God's will. This prayer does that. When it says, Lord, forgive us, what it's saying is we are all the same. We are all sinners. But the thing about being sinners is what is a temptation to you is not a temptation to me. What is a stumbling block for you is just a distraction for me. What is an obsession for me is a nothing to you. So we are the same, but I am uniquely tempted. By the way, we are the same. We all have value to God. We are all sons and daughters of the King. Amen. But your gift and ability is different than mine. Sameness and uniqueness, they both have value. Sameness creates community. This is important. You should write this down. You say, why does it matter that I recognize that everybody here is the same? Because what happens is when you walk in here thinking you're unique, you say, none of these people understand me. Want to bet? We all know about struggle. We all know about bad days. We all know about temptation. We all know about sadness. We all know about loss. Nobody gets the whole cake. Nobody gets out alive. Your prop, the scripture says, there is no temptation uh, given to man except that all people have had it, right? We've all had the different temptations. Yours might be slightly tailored for you because the devil, uh, he, he, uh, he knows how to push buttons, doesn't he? But when we, ha when we focus on sameness, we create community. We create friendships. Now, there are different people. I've been leading churches for a long time, always excellent churches. And uh, I, I had people from all over the country come visit churches I pastored, and they all ask the same question. They say, how do you get so many young people and old people together? How do you get so many black people and white people together? How do you get so many rich people and poor people together? And the idea that I tell them is, if you focus on Jesus, everybody needs Jesus, right? So I'm not trying to make everybody the same in every other way. We don't all have to vote Democrat. We don't all have to vote Republican. We, all, we don't all have to vote. But everybody here needs Jesus. And so com we come together around the idea of Jesus here. That's not the only thing that creates community. My dad is in a garden club and he's in a camera club. So if you like cameras and gardens, you could be a part of that. But there's a ton of people that don't need that. Everybody needs Jesus. That's why the church is the most vibrant organism in the world. 
in every language. People have been meeting all weekend long around the world in Muslim countries and Hindu countries and Baptist, in, uh, uh, Baptist circles and charismatic circles. We're, sameness creates community. Uniqueness creates value. Because although we all need Jesus, Jesus comes through us in different ways. When we worship in just a few minutes, you're going to see people who are gifted worshipers. If I led worship here every weekend, the place would clear out. But if they preached every weekend, the place would clear out. I, the way Jesus comes through me with my gifts is appealing to you. It's, it's just the way that God wired me up. But the way he comes through somebody else is also appealing. Aren't you grateful that not everybody's the same? Yeah, but aren't you grateful that we're the same enough that we could have fellowship? Your uniqueness creates value. Somebody said to me, and I believe it's true, that your sameness creates your circle, but your uniqueness creates your income. LeBron James and I are the same. Wait for it. We're both men. We are both fathers. We are both husbands. We are both uh, young and handsome. We're, we're the same. But the way LeBron's gifts come into the culture, LeBron creates more value. You, you don't have to, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. The world has decided he's worth $50 million a year, and I am not. So if you need money, call LeBron. If you need somebody to fill a 60,000-seat auditorium, call LeBron. There's a new soccer player in Miami. Did you see this? Messi, the great soccer player from France. They hire this dude, and they sell out. And, and stars from all over the world come to watch his first game. He's worth the money. You say, you shouldn't pay that guy $200 million. He'll easily make $200 million, and he'll be worth every cent because he has value to millions of people around the world. So if he gets a nickel from every one of them, he's going to make way more than I make. However, everybody say, however. Yeah. If you're having the worst day of your life, you probably don't want to call LeBron. You should call me because I am a good friend. And I have all kinds of value. When the world starts, starts falling apart, I am an expert. I've been people with people in the worst day of their life. And I have friends for life. Because when your son passes away, when your wife walks out, when they take the house, you got to have somebody who knows what to do and how to pray and how to support. And I am that guy. That's my value. And people, people appreciate it. It's the sameness and the uniqueness coming together. You get it? Say, I get it. Yeah. It's these three things. Number one, it's his image and our gift. His image, our gift. His image, our gift. Every single person here is created in God's image. Every person listening on the online experience is created in God's image. I don't have to say, oh, that street guy. I wonder if he's created. No, no, no. The Bible says it doesn't matter if you're homeless. doesn't matter if you're mentally ill. doesn't matter if you're an addict. doesn't matter if you're single. doesn't matter if you're married. doesn't matter if you're a senior citizen living in a home. That person is created in God's image. True or false? 100%. We are the same. But our gifts, when God created us in his image, he didn't create us identical. Melanie's gifts are different than mine, and they're different than Bob's, and different than Tate's, and different than Jesse's. It is the expression of his image shows up different, and that's a good thing. I am an expert from birth. I am an expert in sameness and image. 
because I was born a twin. And I, I reflect another person's image. When my brother is here, he looks like me and I look like him. That's the nature of being a twin. And it, is a, it has been a fascination my whole life for people. It's like, even to this day, there's, well, incredible. You guys, like, you know. So I can be in Southern California, and if I'm in a neighborhood where my brother lives, it's like, wow. I can, I'll run into one of his friends. It's not as fascinating. After 50 plus years, it's not as fascinating to me as it is to other people. But the sameness has been fun at some time. My, my brother, because we look the same and our voices sound the same, he actually broke up with my girlfriend for me over the phone. That was helpful. If anybody's ever been through a breakup, what you need is a dude that looks like you and talks like you. But his gift is not the same as my gift. The more you know us, the more you go, you guys are nothing alike. Because although we are created in the same image, we have different gifts. Number two, we all have the same purpose, but we have a unique assignment. Stephen's going to lead us in worship today. He's a pastor in the community and filling in for Scott and Ann while they're gone. And Stephen today drives to Chattanooga, Tennessee to become worship and staff pastor at a, ch a church in Chattanooga. His purpose is the same as my purpose. It's the same as your purpose, to, to reflect the glory of God. If you're playing in the NBA, or you're leading worship, or you're sweeping floors, your purpose is the same. And no matter where you're at, no matter what language you speak, no matter your educational level, your purpose is to reflect the glory of God but your assignment will take you different places. I'm never going to Tennessee. I've been to Nashville. I've been to Memphis. Uh, I might go one more time to see Graceland, but after that, I'm out. No Tennessee for me. Am I offending people? I can't tell. Is this a pro-Tennessee crowd? Because it reminds you of Puyallup? What's going on? But... Um, assignment. Some of you pray every day, God, I pray that I could raise my family on a ranch. And every day of my life, I have prayed, God, please don't make me raise my family on a ranch. Because I, that's not the desire of my heart. It's not the, my passion, right? But I'm trying to reflect the glory of God, just like you're trying to reflect the glory of God. I'm assigned to a different girl. I'm assigned to different children. I'm assigned to different responsibility. I'm assigned to a different father. I'm assigned to a different auntie. I'm assigned to a different grandchild. Follow me? Yeah, here's the last thing. We all need forgiveness, and we all need to forgive. When I was a young man, uh, just a child, the first prayer I ever learned, my mother taught me, and she would come up the stairs in our old house. I could hear whenever we had to be in bed, when my mom came up to say prayer. And it was strictly enforced. And there were squeaky steps uh, leading up to my bedroom. And so we could hear the, that meant like dive into bed. There were lots of nights I dove in all sweaty because we were playing, you know, wrestling or whatever. So you dive in, you're breathing heavy, dripping with sweat. Mom was on to us, I'm sure. But she would teach us this prayer. And it went kind of like this. I know there are versions of it, but this is the version I learned. It goes, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Have you ever heard that? Or is there a var variation that you learned? Some of you learned the wrong one. I learned the right one. But as I became older and I went to Bible college, <laughs> I used to harass my mom about it. Because who would teach a two-year-old to go to bed every night thinking about God taking their soul? It's a little intense. But the theology is correct. Uh, 
Now I lay me down to sleep. For one third of my life, I'm unconscious. And when I'm unconscious, I'm believing God is watching over me. And if this is my last, I did two funerals this week. And one day, it's going to be my last day. And one day, it's going to be your last day. So to go to bed every night affirming, God, I need your forgiveness. And when I take my last breath here, I want my next breath to be in heaven. Because we're all the same. We're all sinners. We all make mistakes. There's nobody here who's perfect. Sometimes people get over there in the same train. And they pretend we're all so much the same that other people's sin boggles their mind. <laughs> it's like, I can't believe that they would be that into money. Like, really? You haven't seen the power of what money can do for good? <laughs> uh, I bet you, I bet you can picture it. Sometimes people will go, they'll look over there at people who are different than them. They go, I can't believe that one man would want to sleep with another man. And we get all judgmental about it, right? Like, really? You don't have sins that, you're, that you, impulses that are different from other people's? You don't have to have that one. We are all the same. We are all sinners. And people can sin in different ways, true? And we, we have to get out of our sameness and get out of being so unique and say, Everybody's sin may be different, but everybody's sin can be forgiven. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. Some of you grew up in a theological framework that said, oh, there's an unpardonable sin. The Bible is clear. There is no sin that God won't forgive. There are sins, the hardening of the heart, where you won't ask for forgiveness. And God will not forgive a sin that you won't offer him. But God can forgive any sin, any sexual sin, any financial sin, any relational sin, any lie, any greed, any hurt. I've talked to murderers. I've talked to adulterers. I've talked to all. I, I mean, there must be a sin I haven't heard yet, but I don't know. And I say, say the same thing to everybody. He can forgive them all. Give us this day our daily bread. Take care of us. Because we all need daily bread. But we all have different jobs. And forgive us our trespasses. Because we've all trespassed. But we all trespass in a different way. True? Forgive us our trespasses. As we go around and channel, give away your forgiveness to the people that have hurt us. As my friends in AA like to say, there are no justified resentments. Say that. There are no justified resentments. So God, as you forgive me, I'm going to forgive that man there that hurt me, and that woman there that hurt me, and that person there that stole from me, and that person there that lied about me. You'll, the more grace you give me, the more I'll give to other people so that I can live without resentments and I can live without shame and I can live without guilt. Be free. The Lord's prayer is here that you can be free. You don't have to be obsessed with your past. You don't have to be obsessed with somebody else's past. You don't have to be protecting your sin. Don't call that a sin. Don't call this a sin. You can't call that a sin. My sin is protected. You, you can't. I'm going to make it hate speech if you call that a sin. All the stuff we do to try to feel like we're not sinners, you're our sinner. Everybody here is a sinner. Why not just dive into the ocean of forgiveness? Will you stand with me? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship. And this morning, if you're forgiven of something, you, would you just lift your hands? You don't have to be a great singer. You just have to be greatly forgiven. And they're going to lead us through a couple of songs. And we're going to close this service victorious. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God, I thank you that you sent your son to die for our mistakes. That we can live forgiven and forgiving.
I thank you, God, that you not only provide our daily bread, but you have given us more than enough that we can be a blessing to other people. We can help the poor and we can help the homeless and we can lift people up who are discouraged and suicidal. There is no mistake that's too far from you. And we celebrate it here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, remain standing. Let's worship together. Thanks for coming, buddy. Good to have you. Wasn't that such a great message? Thank you guys for joining us online. If you'd like to join us in person in the house, we have our experience on Saturday at 6 p.m. or Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. We also have our summer second spaces going on. And if you'd like to learn more about it, go to ourchurch.us. Other than that, guys, have a blessed week, and we will see you next weekend.